Can you hear me back? In the back? Can you? Okay. Uh, and this. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Yuli, Anir, and uh, Roger, for uh, with the uh, kind invitation and also this uh, great and comprehensive uh, uh, program. I was a student at one of these winter uh, courses um, 12 years ago on, in systems biology, and it's it's great to be uh, back at, in on this side of the uh, the podium. Um, so uh, Yuli asked me to give uh, two talks. I decided to divide them. Uh, one would be on the question of fold design, and the other would be on the question of biomolecular design. This will come uh, after lunch. Uh, so the we, we can sort of take a, a, a sort of a, a, a large perspective on the field of computational protein design, and the key motivation in this field is sort of if we see all these wonderful developments in the molecular dynamics field, uh, where we have these uh, very sophisticated energy functions with real predictive value um, and, and conformational sampling methods, can we use these methods uh, in order to design new proteins that don't exist in nature? Uh, first, can we design new folds uh, that don't exist in nature? Would they be more stable? What would that teach us about natural proteins, about the evolution of natural proteins? And second, if we can do that, comes the next question, can we design new molecular functions, let's say binders or enzymes, inhibitors, etc. Um, if we can do that, maybe we can stop using uh, proteins from nature uh, when we want to uh, intervene, for instance, in uh, creating new medicines or new enzymes for uh, reactions. So this is a very exciting field for us, at least. Um, I'll today, w what I'll talk about in, in, this, in this talk about principles of full design I'm not actually going to talk in a very detailed way. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to show you some of the uh, key principles uh, that uh, guide uh, this field in terms of, again of energy function confirmation search. What are some of the most uh, advanced achievements uh, of this field? But also some of the challenges uh, in this field. Um, so as sort of an outline, I'll start by speaking about energy functions and confirmation search. You'll see that a lot of what we do in design um, in, in protein design. Uh, is related actually, um, it's derived from uh, developments in, in molecular dynamics. Uh, next I'll talk about uh, new and idealized uh, folds. And the fact that we can design new folds actually tells us that we have uh, a good grasp of both the conformational search and the energy uh, function. And finally, uh, I'll ask a question, what do you do uh, when you don't really have uh, a good energy function? Uh, so we have a, a pretty good grasp of the energy of a protein in solution, in the cytosol, let's say. But what about the membrane? The membrane is a much more complex uh, environment. We saw uh, some of this in, in Ron Droll's uh, talk yesterday. It's a much more complex uh, environment. And our energetics, our understanding of this physical environment um, is, is much less than for soluble proteins. I'll show you that uh, we've, we're, we've been developing an assay, an experimental assay, uh, to measure uh, at high throughput uh, the energetics of uh, protein membrane uh, interactions. All right, with that, uh, I'll start. Uh, and please, I have s many slides, but do stop me with any questions. I, I don't need to go over uh, everything. So the key question in this entire field of computational structural uh, biology is here, right? Uh, we, we imagine a protein coming off of, uh, of the ribosome as, let's Im imagine it as a linear chain, an extended chain of amino acid residues, and by a miraculous process, uh, it ends up in a unique conformation one unique conformation, uh, very highly packed, very dense in the core. Uh, most of the polar groups are outside. Everything that's inside, if it's polar, usually is hydrogen bonded. A unique conformation with a unique function. Um, I, you know, in, in my line of work, I sometimes look at dozens of models and natural proteins a day, and uh, this still fascinates me, the fact that you can see, uh, you can look at the core of a protein and everything seems so relaxed. Uh, the packing is perfect, there are no clashes, no voids. Um, just think about how many degrees of freedom uh, there are for such a linear chain, and it ends up here. So there's a miraculous process here, but we actually know the principle uh, that guides a protein uh, to its uh, final native uh, conformation. Uh, this is actually has been known for uh, four or five decades. This is the thermodynamic hypothesis from uh, uh, Christian Anfinsen. And, and this hypothesis tells us that uh, a protein, and the native conformation of a protein, will be at its uh, low uh, energy, uh, lowest energy conformation. So if you have some schematic description of an energy landscape, what does that mean? You have here on the, this idealized uh, x-axis conformation space, so there are many, many different conformations here. Here's the free energy, or, or actually the energy of interactions. Um, the 
the made of protein will reside in this uh, a global minimum energy conformation. Uh, everything else will be high, uh, high energy. Okay, so uh, I should also say that uh, if these slides look familiar to you, it's because I stole them from Aura. Um, so thank you, Aura. <laughs> um, the key point, so think about computational protein design and modeling as sort of an opportunistic field. We don't really care about the details of the motion of the protein. We, we, we don't care whether uh, they're physically uh, reasonable or not. Uh, so we're not going to solve Newton's equations of, motions, uh, of motion as, as you do in uh, at atomistic uh, molecular dynamics. Instead, what we care about is get us quickly here, right? Or at least in the vicinity uh, of this region so that we can quickly find, uh, map out the energy landscape and identify conformations that are likely to be the native conformation for the molecular system. Again, we don't care how we get there. Um, and then the question becomes, how do you actually sample different conformation in this very high dimensionality uh, space? Yes, please. Uh, That's right. That's right. So uh, Stephen Harrison described hemagglutinin, for instance, which is synthesizes one chain, one linear chain, which has one stable conformation. It's then cleaved uh, in between, and, and then you have two protochains. Uh, and then that state of the protein is already not stable. It's metastable. Actually, there is a lower energy conformation where uh, so the membranes are fused. Are, are stuck in a metastable state and, and are active in this metastable state. That yes. From, uh, so some, some so proteins actually what function what in, in this metastable. Uh, metastability is sometimes uh, an important functional uh, principle for proteins. But in so many experiments, what, what people did, actually starting with uh, even before Anfinson, what people did would, would be to take a, a, a natural protein from its natural environment, um, uh, denature it. So completely lose function. It comes, let's imagine it again as an extended chain, then dilates out the denaturant. What happens time and again is that the protein actually finds uh, its, its native conformation, reta regains function, which tells you that it's actually, since there's no, nothing else going on there, there's, it's just the protein and solution, tells you that what it does is actually uh, 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 a search for uh, the lowest energy uh, conformation. Um, in the cell, there are obviously chaperones, which assist folding, and they can direct uh, folding. Uh, not necessarily. It could, it, ac it could actually be in principle uh, that they would direct folding to something that's not uh, thermodynamically the most stable. But is there an answer? I mean, are, are there 90% of the proteins? I don't know the answer. Does anybody else here know the answer? Is, is there like a statistical, the question is, does anybody know how many of the proteins actually reside in the free energy minimum or whether there are other conformations and, and the native protein is trapped there? Sorry, I don't know the answer, so I'm just, yes. Yes. And then you can see within very, very slow time cycle. All right. But this is extremely rare. This is a rare case. Okay. Because as you will see, if it's a kinetic barrier, yes. you will see a very, very slow time cycle. That's right. That's right. There's one or two cases. So in the majority of cases, this is the picture that emerges. Um, and this again tells us if, if we want to be opportunistic, if we simply want to get here, how do we search uh, this high dimensionality space, this very rugged landscape? And by, by rugged, what do I mean here? Um, imagine you have your native, just imagine your favorite protein in your mind now, and, and take one of the, the hydro angles at the center uh, of the chain, and now rotate it by five or 10 degrees uh, to w in, in any direction. Most likely what would happen is horrible clashes in the core, right? Side chains would overlap with one another. So even if you move very, very slightly, from the native conformation, very, very slightly, uh, the energy can become zero or very, very high. So this is a very difficult landscape uh, for searching. So there's two questions that we ask in, in, in modeling and, and design. One is what is the energy function that we should use in order to evaluate different conformations uh, on this surface? And two, how do we sample conformations in this vast and, and challenging uh, landscape? Okay, and this is what I'll show you next, starting with uh, uh, the energy function and moving on to uh, confirmation search. So deriving an energy function, first let's start with uh, an intuition. Um, this is your typical protein, right? Uh, what do you expect? You see that the hydrophobic or nonpolar residues are packed in the core. Polar residues are outside. 
Uh, the buried polar groups, let's say on the backbone of the, uh, of the chain, are mostly hydrogen bonded, as you see here by these uh, uh, green lines. And there, are, there is basically no strain. There are no voids, almost no clashes, or basically no clashes uh, within the proteins. So it's, it's a well-packed but uh, clash-free uh, conformation. So this is the intuition. This is what we ask uh, of the energy function, also strain-free backbone, meaning, for instance, that a protein cannot exist uh, stably on a helix. It has to exist in, 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 in regions with uh, specific dihedral uh, angles. So this is what we ask of the energy function to encode these uh, sort of rules about uh, the stability of, of proteins. And essentially what we have in, 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 the, in the energy function are, are terms that are very, very similar to what you saw in Michael Levitt's talk uh, on atomistic molecular uh, dynamics. We have Van der Waals packing to take care of the clash-free and, and strain-free and, and strain uh, core hydrogen bonds between uh, polar atoms. I'll talk more about this in, in just a slide, how these are uh, derived. Salvation, this is a key term. Remember from Michael's talk that if you, um, if you simulate the protein, a native protein, in vacuo, it explodes, right? It, it breaks up. Uh, that tells you, and, and, and in water, it's stable in, in the native conformation. That tells you that water is essential, actually, for the stability and conformational uh, stability uh, of proteins. But simulating water is very, very computationally uh, challenging. I uh, imagine, as, as you saw in these simulations, there are sort of wriggling worms around the around the protein, and I would think that you're just making one mutation during design, you're changing an alanine into an arginine, taking a, a different conformation and a different residue identity in the protein. This is something we want to do in design. Now you're displacing water molecules, you need to equilibrate uh, the water molecules around that. That becomes computationally uh, very demanding, essentially impossible uh, to do uh, quickly. So what we do in, in Rosetta and in other uh, simulations is use an implicit salvation uh, model, whereby Imagine here you have an aspartate. Each atom on the aspartate, let's say this, uh, um, uh, the, the, the carboxylate, this uh, oxygen <coughs> here, has some potential uh, depending on the number of heavy atoms around it. So these are the heavy atoms around it. Um, we know that uh, uh, each such heavy atom displaces water and thereby desolvates uh, these polar groups. And that gives us an intuition about what this salvation term uh, should be. Uh, so the more hydrophobic groups, the closer they are uh, to the polar atom, the higher the penalty uh, on desalvation. And this is a very fast term to actually compute, very, very quickly. Um, then we have residue confirmation probabilities. We'll talk about these in more detail. <laughs> if you look through the PDB, you see that there are, uh, for every amino acid, there's, it's, it's not completely free uh, to sample all confirmations. There are uh, specific peaks in the, uh, uh, in the distributions of confirmations. And pair potentials, which are these knowledge-based potentials, exactly as Michael showed, uh, where, um, for instance, counter charges um, are favored if they're interacting with one another, and like charges repel one another. So while these are physical uh, terms, uh, these are statistical terms, they're derived from statistics, but even these physical terms, while we know their form, we understand how what they should look like, and I'll show you an example of that soon. For instance, for Van der Waals interactions, we know what the, uh, the potential should look like. Uh, we sometimes don't exactly know what the amplitudes and the distributions along these potentials should be. And in those cases, we need to uh, calibrate these, uh, f these functional forms using experimental data. And this is what we often do. And I'll just show you one example uh, of this uh, for the hydrogen bonding uh, energy. So hydrogen bonding has an electrostatic term, which is distance dependent, but also it's, it's partly covalent, it has a part covalent uh, uh, bond uh, nature. And so it has some rotational uh, uh, determinants for, the, for uh, uh, its energy profile. So again, we, we understand what the functional form uh, of a hydrogen bonding potential should look like, but what should be the magnitudes? And where should the peaks uh, lie uh, along this potential? So for instance, for this, this is a donor atom, this is the hydrogen, the proton connected to it, here's <laughs> the acceptor atom, let's say an oxygen in this case, connected to another residue or whatever. Here, this is a, uh, for backbone-backbone um, uh, 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 interactions within, hydrogen bonding interactions within a helix. Um, so there are four parameters defining this, the, this theta angle between the donor hydrogen and the hydrogen acceptor uh, atom, the psi angle here, the distance obviously between uh, the, the hydrogen and the acceptor, and this rotation around the acceptor uh, atom bond. And for each of them, you can derive, uh, a, for again, for you go to the PDB, and you can derive uh, statistics, the distributions 
uh, for each of these degrees of freedom, for each atom type, in each context, right? For a backbone, for side chain, side chain interactions, for side chain backbone interactions. And you get these distributions. And from those, you can extract that, say, at, at these distances, obviously the energy should be very high. This is the peak. At this distance, the energy should be zero. So you can derive an energy from these uh, potentials, and again, for each parameter. So again, this just gives you a sense, a flavor, of how energies, energies can be parameterized in a, in a quick way and in a robust physical way. Yes? Yes? I'll, I'll get the water bottle. <laughs> right, so that's a, a key question. So uh, the membrane environment is obviously more hydrophobic. Uh, the electrostatic terms in hydrogen bonding would become stronger uh, within a hydrophobic environment. No, to actually contract because uh, they, they will become stronger. The, the, as the dielectric uh, constant decreases, so the electrostatic terms increase. But I think it's the um, actually, no. Maybe at the ends of the helices, they fray, but those are at the, at the ends. I think the statistical potential show that the hydrogen bonds, and also just. Think about this, um, they are different, but not so different. So in the cores of proteins, that's essentially a low dielectric environment. And we'll t I'll talk about this at the end of the talk. It's a low dielectric environment, and there the, uh, the environment is very similar to the membrane, in fact. And, and you see the same contraction of, of distances. And this is why you have uh, for backbone-backbone uh, distances are, sh are typically shorter than side chain, side chain interactions, which are on the surface. Yes? Uh, sorry, yes? Yes, that's, uh, that's typically what's done. But for membrane proteins, that's a separate problem. I'll talk about this at the end, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we've recently done. There's, there's special problems uh, with the membrane. Yes, Scully? So, uh, this implies that we should see different uh, helices in the uh, membrane versus in the cytosol, so the pitch should be a bit different. Different this is, is what we also see in the PDD. D different is, is not. I, I don't want to make the, these differences. You, you know, this scale is very, very fine. Uh, so the differences are slight. Uh, you typically see more canonical and longer helices, um, typically, uh, in, in the membrane, because, again, of the, 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 the pitch doesn't change, no. It's but they're is, is the determined the, the distance of the... So the, 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 the mean is would be, the mean would be just, the, the, the variance would be smaller, simply. Uh, but, you know, helices are essentially what Pauling told us 60 years ago. Uh, okay? Um, does it not work anymore? Okay, so now that we understand energetics, um, we can move on to confirmation sampling. And again, here the, the, the key question is how, how do you work with this high dimensionality, rag, rugged uh, energy landscape? Uh, the native state lies here somewhere and, and the energy landscape is, is vast and, f and mostly flat with high peaks and, and low minima. And how do you find this thing? Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, small confirmation changes can result in huge spikes in, in the energy. Um, so the strategy in Rosetta, for instance, and in other uh, prediction uh, methods is to use, is, is sort of first to smooth uh, the energy uh, landscape. And what, what does that mean? Imagine that you have um, the atomistic energy landscape would look like this red line, jagged, jagged, jagged. And here there's maybe this uh, um, global minimum energy confirmation. There's other minima here. Uh, you certainly want to avoid the peaks, right? That's, that's basically what you want to You never want to sample here, 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 and there, right? So let's just consider uh, 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 one example. It, it applies to all examples in, in confirmation sampling. Think about two proteins. You're docking them against one another. Um, avoid all confirmations that clash with one another, right? Where the two proteins uh, invade one another's space, right? Those are, would be very high in, in atomistic energy. Similarly, avoid all confirmations where they're separated, the energy would be zero. Right? You only care about confirmations that sort of sample the, uh, the surfaces, the interfaces between them. And that's a, a simple geometric property. You don't actually need to know where every hydrogen bond lies. You just need to have the general geometric properties of each of the proteins and to sort of make sure that they don't clash and don't go too far uh, apart. And this would be the smooth energy function shown here. So essentially what you need to do is first start sampling in the smooth energy 
uh, landscape. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of detail about that. Uh, you make moves in this landscape. It's an, a much, much easier uh, landscape uh, to work in because things are not as detailed. Every move is much easier to compute. Um, it's not very accurate, right? This, this would appear to you to be the, uh, sorry, this would appear to you to be the global minimum. Uh, whereas in fact, if you, if you start from this, from a confirmation here, and you refine it using high energy or the atomistic energy function, you'd reach the global minimum. So it doesn't give you the exact answer, but it gives you some solutions from which you can start uh, refinement uh, simulations and, and maybe sample the correct confirmation. Um, so what's this low energy smooth energy function? Um, this, is, uh, this one is completely undetailed, right? Because we want to make uh, fast moves, want to evaluate uh, different confirmations very, very uh, quickly. Uh, so it's basically a geometry dominated um, uh, uh, force field where, for instance, you have just burial preferences. Aspartates don't want to be in the core of a protein. Leucines do want to be in the core. Uh, simple potentials, pairs, uh, uh, positive next to negative. Um, ge geometry potentials, how helices and beta sheets interact with one another. Uh, no, obviously, some, some sort of van der Waals uh, uh, potential to avoid, to prevent clashes, but favor some interactions. And this radius of gyration, which favors compact globular structures over these elongated uh, conformations. Okay, so very, very simple, simplistic uh, energy functions. Just to search very quickly through this uh, energy landscape. So let's think about what is confirmational sampling going to look like? Um, really at a glance, uh, you make some uh, coarse-grained moves, some very uh, uh, hard moves to make, usually, uh, in this low-resolution low uh, uh, landscape. Uh, for instance, you, you change the backbone. I mentioned earlier that imagine that you change the one dihedral angle by five uh, degrees somewhere. Now imagine that you're changing a bunch, like let's say a stretch of nine uh, amino acid residues, the dihedrals for all of them. Uh, this would be uh, one type of move, then some local optimization, where you try to refine the structure locally. And then you go into high uh, resolution atomistic refinement where you repack the core, you make sure that the hydrogen bonds are uh, correct, you minimize everything to make sure that everything is, is right in place. And then you can evaluate the energy and ask what is the lowest energy uh, confirmation. So it's sort of a hierarchical um, uh, confirmation search uh, process. Um, so let's take a, a, a quick look at, at this, uh, uh, at this confirmation sampling, the low resolution confirmation sampling. This needs to be efficient. We just care about getting to the low energy confirmation quickly. It doesn't need to be exhaustive. It can't be exhaustive. We can't search a uh, confirmation space for a reasonable protein uh, exhaustively. Um, so how is this done in Rosetta? Uh, in, in Rosetta, we have a, a library taken from the PDB where uh, we evaluate all the uh, backbone dihedral angles for short stretches of, of peptides in, in the PDB. And that's known as the backbone fragment uh, library. So you have fragments for helices, uh, for loops, and for sheets, different confirmations that you observe in the PDB. What's useful about this? Uh, these are realistic confirmations. We know that proteins actually fold into these local confirmations. They maintain some local contacts, uh, and therefore uh, we actually have some information that what, what sequences actually fold into the confirmations. This is very helpful uh, during confirmation sampling. We don't actually need to look at confirmations or the rationale in Rosetta is that we don't actually need to look at confirmations uh, that don't exist out there in nature. The PDB is large enough. Um, so you start, again, you have this protein coming off of the ribosome, imagine. It's an extended confirmation. You introduce these fragments into the protein. You find uh, these local uh, structures form rather quickly in, in such uh, low resolution simulations. And then very, very quickly, as, as you, uh, you still don't go into refinement, you still do these uh, coarse-grained uh, moves uh, for the protein, and you get to these compact architectures. And if you look at this, you can see that uh, these compact conformations often do favor burying the hydrophobic uh, residues in the core, the polar residues are outside, the back one makes sense, it's helices, sheets, things make, uh, often make sense in these trajectories, but there's no specifics here. Then we go into high-resolution refinement where, again, you, you, you actually minimize, you pack the side chains, make sure that all the contacts it makes sense, no clashes, no voids. Um, about sidechain confirmations. So how do you sample, uh, even, even this, uh, this question of how do you find uh, the, the optimal uh, confirmation for all the sidechains in a protein becomes very, very large, very, very quickly, even for a 50 residue protein. In an example I'll show you uh, soon, it becomes very, very difficult. So you need some guide into this uh, uh, vast confirmation space. And what people have done uh, for the 
essentially two decades, is again to sample the PDB, look at confirmations that exist in the PDB. For instance, for serine, uh, you see for the Chi-1, the first dihedral angle uh, in the side chain, you see three <coughs> probability peaks. Again, just as I showed you for hydrogen bonding, you can derive an energy function, a pseudo-energy function, uh, from these peaks that would favor confirmations that lie uh, at the peaks. And again, this, this sort of um, uh, makes sure that you, you have a realistic energy function for the side chain, and also sampling uh, of the correct, of, of, the, of reasonable confirmations. Um, so but in this case, it should be combinatorial. Combinatorial? <laughs> this is just the next slide. Um, so how do you find a combination of such residues? Again, this problem explodes very, very quickly. Can you do a full enumeration of this problem? It's, it's impractical. So even for a, a 50 residue protein with just two dihedrals per chain on average, you get to this number. So you can't really enumerate all the possibilities. Even if you just look uh, at individual, uh, at, at high probability of rodomers, it's, it's just impossible uh, to go through uh, such a, a huge landscape. So what people have typically done, yes, um, is use Monte Carlo sam sampling. We, Brazil uses Monte Carlo sampling. Other people use dead end elimination or other methods. It almost doesn't matter. Uh, all these heuristic methods uh, are useful. They don't necessarily converge on the, uh, on the global minimum, but I'll show you how uh, we approach this problem. Um, but they do find, very quickly, they find low energy uh, uh, combinations um, of, of residues. Um, so let's, let's think about, uh, again, this problem of, let's imagine two proteins are docking against one another. You want to uh, allow some conformational flexibility, sort of like induced fit, uh, between the two proteins. So how do you find the, the low energy conformation here? So you have some rigid body optimization that you need to make, uh, some backbone optimization, and side chain optimization. The key idea here, and, and this comes again and again throughout my talk, it will come again and again, uh, iterate between different types of moves. So you start at any random conformation. You make a rigid body perturbation. Imagine the two proteins are here. Some rigid body perturbation. Uh, typically, you rise in energy. This, uh, any random move you introduce will usually increase the energy. Now you refine it by doing some side chain optimization. You lower it. Some more refinement, just minimization of the rigid body, minimization of the side chains. You get to a, a local minimum. And you repeat this process. You, you generate another perturbation. You iterate through this. Uh, this, this process of iterative um, perturbation uh, minimization, perturbation minimization, does find uh, very low energy confirmations and sequences uh, during modeling. Okay? Yes? Um, is this same way also works with the domain swap? Since it, it is very common, common domains usually for the same protein, that you see a domain swap. So In dimers. Yes, this, this is a question about uh, symmetric docking, essentially. Uh, there, are, there are approaches into this. And yeah, symmetric docking works exactly in the same way, only since they're symmetrical, any move you make in one chain applies to the other chain. So anything you've done to even a side chain on one chain applies to the other chain. Yes. No. <laughs> Emphatically, no. Uh, this is, um, I, I really don't think so. The, the, the natural process is Newton's uh, laws of motion, what, what we've seen with atomistic uh, molecular dynamics. These moves are uh, often ridiculous. If you, if you look at what happens to a protein folding in, in Rosetta, uh, it happens very quickly. Uh, it's, a f it's an efficient process in Rosetta um, compared to molecular dynamic simulations. But the moves are just uh, um, illogical. You see a, a helix change into a sheet. In, in one step, for instance. So yeah, I, I don't think these are uh, kinetically representative of anything. They're not no, dynamics. Ah, I see. Yeah, there are, there are these... Uh, There are funnels in confirmation space. So these regions where <coughs> interaction energies are sort of low, but they direct the confirmation towards the end state. That's true for docking, for instance. Uh, so people have utilized this. I think Paul Bates, for instance, for 
finding uh, conformations. Uh, but I think in the end, uh, the, the true kinetics are uh, mo much more similar to molecular uh, dynamics, atomistic molecular dynamics. What you do here, would you agree, very similar to what physics called simulated It is simulated amnesia. <laughs> it's, it's exactly that. So when I say, okay, the next slide should show Monte Carlo. So uh, w w whenever you do this cycle, you evaluate the, the energy using the Metropolis criterion. Uh, if it uh, if it uh, decreases, great. If it increases, sometimes you accept. And as you do the simulation with time, you decrease the temperature. Exactly simulate a milling process. Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm not an expert on folding, but uh, yes, this is true. So, uh, the, the thinking is that they uh, locally collapse very quickly. And this is the, the sort of idea for, for the fragment insertion process that I showed you is, is derived from the folding field. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Local, so there's, um, there's evidence that um, um, secondary structure propensity plays a role even in the unfolded state of a protein. So uh, a segment with high helical propensity would fold into a helix even, potentially even in the unfolded state. And uh, can I, yeah, uh, and then they would associate with one another. So there is a secondary step. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so that's the f part of the funneling notion in, in protein folding. Yes, yes. But I, I don't want to give the false, false impression that anything you see in Rosetta uh, is physically reasonable, th that simulations are not. They're not meant to be. <laughs> um, all right, so can we use this? Now, now that you're experts in both energy confirmation search, can you design a new protein from scratch? And uh, this was the question that uh, um, many people have asked uh, in the past. And over the past decade, there has been uh, really consistent and very high success uh, in this uh, question, which on its face, on its, its face value, seems incredibly complex. And what is the question here? This is known, um, this is a term coined, I think, by David Eisenberg, uh, as the inverse folding problem. In folding, we typically think about, this is the sequence of, of the natural protein. Uh, what is the conformation? How, how is it going to reach uh, the end state, this, uh, this global minimum energy conformation? This is the typical way of thinking about folding. Inverse folding, or design, is given this conformation, no sequence on it, it's just helices in different orientations, beta sheets, etc. What is the sequence that would fold into this confirmation or something close to this confirmation? That's the question we ask in, in design. Why is this question uh, interesting? Because if we get it right, and I'll show you that now consistently we do get it right. If we get it right, we can form uh, shapes of proteins by essentially self-assembly, right? We just uh, 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 give a bacterium a gene and that gene would be uh, transcribed and translated into an amino acid chain, and that chain would spontaneously fold into the conformation we designed on the computer. So that's very exciting. It also teaches us whether the energy function conformation search are effective, or are they actually representative of what's happening in nature? So that's the question. Um, and already in 2003, uh, the, the, there was one, the first example of this, uh, in, in, in a protein known as TOP7, Topology7. Uh, this is work from the Baker Lab uh, where they essentially designed, they sketched on a piece of paper um, a topology, different topologies for proteins. They sketched seven, uh, where a topology means, forget about the residues, <laughs> the, the amino acid identities you see here. The topology basically means we're going to have a sheet, a beta strand here, loop, beta strand, loop, helix, beta, loop, helix. Yeah, you get the, the drift, right? So that's the topology. Uh, not only that, they also ask for specific interactions uh, between residues and the beta strands, as you see here. They don't want it to form just any, in any random way. They want it to be specific. So this would be sort of your uh, target uh, topology in this case. And now, what is the sequence? Fill in the details here. What is the sequence that would fold uh, into this uh, topology? Um, and the answer is very similar to what I showed you 
or, or the method in order to achieve this is very similar to what I showed you earlier. It's essentially the same. Um, iterate between low resolution moves where you introduce different conformations to the backbone, uh, refinement moves where all the details are counted, every hydrogen bond, every Van Waals interaction, and iterate between these, again, introduce uh, low resolution moves, go back to high resolution, et cetera, et cetera, and drill in the energy landsca landscape until you reach a very low energy confirmation. Um, so this is the design algorithm, derive the constraints from the scratch. What, what do the constraints mean? I'm gonna have a helix here. That means that I'm only gonna sample fragments from helical fragments, from helical structures in the PDB, local fragments of helices. Here's gonna be a strand, so only strand fragments. Here it's gonna be a loop, so only loop fragments. Also the distances, right? The, if I want these two uh, residues to interact with one another, they have to be within a specific distance. So penalize anything that's too far. Uh, then you design sequences for all uh, the backbones. You allow all amino acids at, at many residues of the protein, but only polar residues at the surface. It all makes sense, right? This is what you expect for a protein. And you start sampling, right? Fragment insertion, uh, minimization, packing, another fragment insertion, et cetera, et cetera. And you cycle through this many, many times <coughs> until you reach very low energy sequence confirmation. Okay? Nine and three, yes. Nine. Yeah, so nine sort of captures, you know, intuitively you would say, nine sort of captures uh, two helical turns or a, helical, a helix plus loop. And three sort of captures the local confirmation, again, on one helical turn and maybe a beta confirmation. Um, and these are the results. I think many people uh, recognize this uh, from, the, from the paper where the model is in blue and the crystal structure in, in red. And the backbone accuracy is incredibly high in, in these. So you see it's, a, it's about 1.2 uh, angstrom uh, backbone accuracy. The rotomers are, even the rotomers are roughly in the right places. Some errors here and there, but it, it doesn't seem like anything major. This is uh, an outstanding success uh, for, for, uh, for such a large uh, problem, right? 90 plus uh, residues uh, designed, folded on the computer, and then coming out exactly, essentially exactly. Um, as you design them. Uh, what was also quite remarkable about this protein, this came up again and again in these full design experiments, very high stability, uh, unlike many natural proteins. So in some of the uh, de novo design folds that people have designed very recently, they've seen uh, delta G of unfolding in the range of 60 and above kilocalories per mole, where the typical numbers for natural proteins are between five and 20, right? So it's, it's really remarkably stable uh, proteins. And again, that also highlights or underscores the, uh, wh why this is so exciting. Uh, not only do these proteins fold in the into the correct conformation, um, they, uh, they are actually very stable. They would potentially be easy to work with. It's not exactly yeah. like that, but, but they are very stable. Yes? Yes. Yes, yes. The answer is yes. This is actually with the next slide, but uh, actually that goes back even earlier uh, than this to the um, modeling and experiments of uh, Steve Mayo, um, who took a zinc finger, a smaller domain, uh, redesigned it on the computer, and then showed that it folds into the correct conformation uh, with a very different sequence, a sequence that was completely unrelated to other uh, zinc fingers. Uh, so yeah, that, that is true. Very different. Uh, yes? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's uh, that's a difficult question. And with time, I think I think even for top seven, uh, with time, uh, another fold, another protein was was found in nature, which had before time. Okay, so there you go. It's it's a this is a difficult question. Uh, I think more recently they just avoid this question completely uh, because fold space is is actually quite well occupied. Um, so uh, this is perhaps even an embarrassing point, but essentially what, what they did is, is really sketch this, uh, the shape on a piece of paper and, and ask the question, what would be a, a sequence that would fold into that? And again, they've repeated this uh, time and again since then. This is, this is from Nobukoga's uh, work uh, three years ago, where you see he's, he's done this for two dozen proteins now. Um, it's an amazing reproducibility and robustness. And again, very stable, uh, unique conformations. Yes? Can you when you say that from very different sequences you get the same fold. Yes. Did you look at 
So sometimes you see identity, yeah. And the reason of this question is a weak thermal crystal structure of two proteins with that they make a complex. They they are identical in the fold, and the identity in the sequence is five percent. Yeah, that's um, it's remarkable, but actually not uh, unique, right? In in many cases in in natural proteins, you see this very low identity, still convergence on the same fold. So did you look at the what are the key residues? So sometimes you see identity. You see yeah, you can see some identity, but that doesn't mean that the overall sequence identity would be uh, high. It's it's actually very low. If you look at last, it doesn't seem like these these proteins belong to this family. Uh, question? Okay. Um, so again, very reproducible, very high success rate. Um, and to move on, uh, they've also been able to use the same strategy, essentially, in order to construct these sort of, these are not exactly what capsids, virus capsids would look like, but sort of cages of proteins, uh, uh, high order oligomeric structures which form these uh, large cages. And again, the same basic principle, uh, iterate between conformational change uh, minimization, packing, drill into the energy landscape until you find very low energy conformation sequences. Okay? Great. So just to summarize uh, this part of the talk, um, this notion of iterative cycles of sequence design and conformation minimization really seems to be able to design very stable uh, conformations, uh, very stable, uh, se the sequences are unique, but they fold into the desired conformations time and again. Uh, it seems like a uh, solve problem maybe even. Um, and, and successful designs uh, demonstrate that we really have a, a, a fairly good grasp of the design principles uh, of, of soluble folds, uh, which means the energy function and confirmation sampling. I'll provide some caveats in, in just a slide, but uh, just for now, think about this as an optimistic uh, uh, statement. Um, and the question which I'll leave for after lunch um, is given that it's fairly easy now to design new folds. What do you think would be the, uh, the case? Would design a function be easy or hard? We'll talk about, think about this in your head um, as I talk about membranes. Um, but uh, uh, I'll give you the answer. It's hard. Um, but why, why would that be? We'll, we'll discuss this uh, after lunch. So now as we're transitioning uh, to talk about uh, uh, membranes, before that, um, I'd like to ask the question, why did, these, wh why did it work? Why, why was top seven so successful? Why can Nobu just design dozens of proteins in the computer and actually get these atomic accuracy uh, uh, um, designs actually in experiment? I'm not jealous, I'm just asking a question. So <laughs> why, why does it work? Um, the answer is that the energy function is, is good. Right? When I say good, I mean good enough. It's, it's not actually uh, accurate, but it, it, is, it does do the job. And but when I say does it does the job, I, I mean something as, as you see in these uh, uh, images here. Um, time and again, when you, we look at different molecular systems, we see that it is able, the energy function is able, to discriminate between near-native and far-from-native uh, conformations. Essentially, it reproduces uh, the thermodynamic hypothesis. So this is, for instance, for the folding of a small domain. We reach the native conformation, even the, again, core uh, rotomers are there. And you see this, this is, the, uh, this is called an energy landscape, where this is the uh, interaction energy computed, let's say, with Rosetta, or here, actually, molecular dynamics simulations from DE Shaw. Um, and this is the RMSD, the, the deviation uh, from the native conformation. The farther you go, typically, the higher uh, the energy. Okay, and this is, again, time and again for uh, small monomers, for RNA duplexes, for symmetric homo-oligomers. This is something Gali asked about before. And it's for ligand binding using molecular dynamics uh, simulations. So it doesn't mean that the energy function is accurate, by no means, but it's good enough in order to discriminate between near native and far from native confirmations, which means that if we have an effective confirmation search method, we should be able to identify uh, the, the, the native confirmation, and we should be able to use it in order to design uh, new structures. Um, so this is the basic point the energy gap between near native and far from native confirmations. If we look at Membrane proteins, the situation is more uh, difficult. Um, this is the energy landscape for a high affinity homodimer interaction, uh, glycophorin A. Uh, it's, it's been a model system for protein-protein uh, uh, interactions uh, in the membrane for at least 20 years. 
Um, and this is what you see using the Rosetta energy function for membrane proteins. A completely flat energy landscape, very, very poor. Um, and if you look at low energy conformations here, what you see are actually um, disturbing to the eye pictures such as this, where uh, the Rosetta prefers a conformation where it packs more uh, hydrophobic residues in the core of the, of the two helices, and it exposes the backbone. It essentially kinks uh, the helix in order to form these more Van der Waals interactions. Uh, each such kink is probably worth as much as two to three uh, kilocalories per mole, so it's uh, incredibly disruptive. It tells us something about the energy function, the fact that it doesn't really recognize uh, the environment uh, correctly. It doesn't realize, realize, or it doesn't encode correctly uh, the fact that exposing the polar backbone to a hydrophobic environment uh, is very disruptive. Okay, so uh, we started from this. Um, okay, let, let's first ask the question, why is the membrane environment uh, so challenging? This is uh, a member protein, for instance, uh, in, in its native environment, uh, in, in, a, in a simulation. So you have uh, lipids, lipid chains here, water molecules here. Uh, the water environment we understand quite well, as I showed you earlier. But other than that, uh, this is a very complex, very heterogeneous uh, environment. Uh, you have phosphate head groups here, which are polar, very polar here, and are negatively charged here. This negative charge is very important because interactions with these negative charges often determine the orientation of a protein with respect to the membrane. For those of you who know the positive, positive inside rule, uh, says that arginines and lysines would be preferentially placed in this environment rather than here. Uh, so the orientation of a protein in the membrane is determined by these interactions. Uh, the lipid core is obviously the most uh, uh, different environment from, from water molecules. Uh, lipid chains, acyl chains, very hydrophobic, but we actually know that there is also water molecules uh, that surround uh, proteins. So a very complex environment. We have a rather rudimentary and, and poor understanding uh, of its uh, energetics. Um, so this is sort of this is sort of been our goal here. Uh, we cannot model or barring very specific and, and actually beautiful examples from the uh, the Grado lab for uh, design of membrane proteins. Uh, it, it has not been consistent. We haven't been able to design uh, membrane proteins as well as uh, soluble proteins, and we want to reach uh, that stage too. So our goals are uh, to devise a high throughput experimental assay that would inform us about the energetics of protein-protein interactions in the membrane, and also about the energetics of a protein within the membrane. So for instance, about the hydrophobicity uh, and the positively, positive inside rule uh, in the membrane. So we're not the first to think that this is uh, an important uh, problem. This is just one example. There, there have been many approaches uh, to this problem for over 30, uh, 40 years. Um, this is a work by uh, Gunnar von Heine from about uh, a decade ago, uh, where they took a, a naturally occurring uh, hydrophobic protein that actually goes into the endoplasmic uh, reticulum. It has two transmembrane domains. It has two glycosylation sites. Uh, naturally, and they engineer the hydrophobic segment in between the th these two glycosylation sites. So think about it, if, th if this hydrophobic segment, if it's polar, it wouldn't be inserted into the membrane, it would be translocated, and then you get two glycosylation sites. If it's inserted, uh, only one of the glycosylation sites would be uh, glycosylated, the other one would not be. And then on a simple gel shift assay, you should be able to tell the difference between no glycosylation, single glycosylation, doubly glycosylated uh, protein, which would tell you about the uh, partitioning uh, between of the hydrophobic segment between membrane inserted and uh, um, outside, right? So very elegant assay uh, within actual, actually occurring natural uh, biological uh, membranes. However, and, and it is the first. Um, however, these gel shift assays are difficult to quantify. Uh, you can't use them at very high uh, throughput. And the other thing is that the energies that they got out of these measurements um, did not really match what people would expect uh, for uh, membrane proteins. So for instance, the most they could see for a contribution for insertion, uh, for instance for isoleucine, leucine, or phenylalanine was at most uh, about minus 0.5 kilocalorie per mole. So if you take these scales, the, the, the energies that you compute uh, from the von Heine scales and just go through the proteome, the, the membrane, membrane proteins, and, and measure or compute the uh, apparent energy of insertion for individual helices into the membrane, you find that they're positive on average, according to the uh, to these uh, scales from von Heine, for just a second. Uh, so the, the key question here is, what is the driving 
uh, the driving force for insertion, if hydrophobicity is so low, the contribution from hydrophobicity uh, is so low, what drives the insertion of helices into the membrane? Uh, Odell? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is just at the core of the membrane. They have a scale for almost every position across the membrane. Uh, this is just at the core. Yes. It seems to be compressed. The, the, the people have commented on this uh, many times in the past, that these scales seem to be shifted, compressed. They, they are different from what we expect. Now, I mentioned the positive inside rule, which actually von Heine discovered in the 1980s. Uh, the scales don't uh, capture that. The, for instance, for lysine and arginine, <coughs> what you would expect is to see that the inserting the lysine or arginine in the cytoplasmic region of the protein uh, would be favored uh, relative to the periplasmic, or in this case, um, endoplasmic reticulum uh, region, but they see completely symmetric uh, potentials for <coughs> lysine and arginine. So now you ask, what determines the orientation of a protein? If this is true, what determines the orientation of a protein uh, relative to the membrane? So. Uh, this assay is great. It gave us some information about translocon, protein interactions. It's, it's really a, a wonderful, just a second, wonderful assay, but there are significant, let's say, uncertainties about it. Yes? Yes, which is very similar to this. Yes, they are similar, yeah. Uh, the hydrophobicity scale by white is uh, for the partitioning of amino acid residues or peptides. Uh, to, I think, octanol versus water. So it's not a, a true membrane. No. It's an it's a, um, organic, organic sol solvent versus water. Yeah. Yes? <coughs> By the gel shift acid. I, I don't want to go but into too much detail here. Well, this is, obviously it's in an, an, any Western blot is in an ensemble of millions or billions of molecules. It's, if, it's, if it happens by chance, it's going to be fine. Right? It's, it's not just one molecule. Ah, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I actually don't know. Yeah. Yes? Five minutes? Gosh. Let me speed through. <laughs> um, so we, uh, yeah, this is another assay for uh, measuring uh, dimerization efficiency uh, in the membrane. And, and what's cool about this is that it couples uh, uh, by physical event the dimerization of two helical segments in the membrane to viability in, in, in bacteria. How does it do that? Th this is a transcriptional activator. Uh, in bacteria, and it, it, it activates the transcription of uh, a resistance factor against chloramphenicol. Chloramphenicol is, uh, is an antibiotic. Uh, so this, this assay is very cool, and, and we're going to use it, and I'll show you how. And this, this is the work of uh, Asafid Azal and Jonathan Weinstein, who is here. Um, high throughput characterization of memory protein thermodynamics. Um, we took this assay, the Toxcat assay, viability assay, and changed it a little bit. We added beta-lactamase uh, in the periplasm. Beta-lactamase gives us, gives us uh, a, a good sensor for protein expression levels in the membrane. It turns out, this is an old paper, people have largely forgotten about it, uh, but it turns out that the expression levels of, of proteins in the membrane or of beta-lactamase anchored to the membrane uh, correlate with the viability of, of bacteria uh, on ampicillin. Okay, so this is a beautiful way, again, of, of coupling um, a biophysical trait, the insertion into the membrane, to uh, uh, viability. Okay? Um, so this is the procedure uh, Asaf has uh, developed. He starts by designing a library of mutants. He takes a, a, a membrane protein, a transmembrane protein, designs a library of mutants, every point mutation at every position uh, in the membrane. Uh, he then uses uh, standard cloning uh, uh, and, and um, transforms bacteria, this, the, the li uh, bacteria uh, with this library and plates this exact, the, exactly the same library on either selective or non-selective uh, agar. 
Um, he comes in the next day, harvests the cells, mini-preps, takes out the, the plasmids, uh, PCR amplifies, and subjects this to next-generation sequencing. Now, next-generation sequencing is a quantitative way of, of describing what you have in the library. It tells you, for instance, that in arginine in the core, you have just maybe three uh, such variants in your selected library versus maybe 10,000 or 100,000 uh, variants in your unselected library. <coughs> and now you can derive from these frequencies something that resembles uh, an energy function. It's not completely kosher. This would be an energy function for insertion into the membrane, but we're not actually measuring uh, the cytosolic uh, fraction of the protein. We're just measuring changes in the expression levels within the membrane. So it's not kosher. Uh, but it does give us some uh, energetics, and we get these pretty matrices out of it. Um, Not completely, but uh, quite completely. So um, I think in almost 90% of the, of the mutations, we have more than 100 um, clones in the unselected library, which means pretty it's, it's, it's very good coverage. You can even make it higher. Shira uh, can make it higher. <laughs> um, so uh, this is what you get out of it. And, and w what are the advantages here of next generation sequencing and, and this sort of thing? Uh, you really don't need to be cheap on anything, right? It's, it's just one experiment. So just test all point mutations. So you get a really systematic, comprehensive view uh, of, the, uh, of the energetics. Uh, this is in a true biological membrane. There's complete equality of experimental conditions. All of the mutants are on the same plate, same temperature, same antibiotic concentration. Uh, there's much less uh, experimental noise than in any other assay. It's also high accuracy. The error rate in deep sequencing is very low compared to ELISA, Westerns, or whatever uh, other assays. So SF took CLS, uh, a human uh, protein with a transmembrane segment that, importantly for us, doesn't homodimerize. So it just goes into the membrane, serves as a membrane anchor. So now every point mutation you introduce here doesn't actually affect uh, the uh, equilibrium between monomeric and dimeric forms, because there is no dimeric form. It's only it only affects the expression levels within the membrane. It gets out this matrix, and you can already see that it makes sort of sense, right? Because uh, mutations in the core to polar residues are disruptive, whereas to apolar residues are favorable. You can sort of make out the positive inside rule. Arginine and lysine are favored in the cytoplasm versus the uh, periplasm. Uh, this is nice, but we want this in a more quantitative form. Uh, in order to get from here to there, what we do first is to subtract from every uh, mutation the effects of mutating to alanine because we want to have a uh, constant reference frame for every uh, uh, mutation, right? If, if, the, uh, if this position has a, uh, an alanine here, but a methionine here, we want to take, subtract the contribution of the wild type. So that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we smooth uh, these potentials. So for every position we measure, we take the average of five or four neighboring positions. So two to the left, two to the right and take the average. So we smooth and thereby we get these uh, potentials. There's no other uh, data manipulation here. Let's look at these potentials a little bit more carefully. Um, you can see that the troughs, this is again for every position across the membrane. You can see that the troughs for the uh, hydrophobic residues make a lot of sense, right? Valine is near zero. Isoleucine, leucine, and phenylalanine are about minus two, which is, makes more sense than uh, the von Heine scales. Serine, threonine, and cysteine are relatively flat. The disruptive, the polar residues are highly disruptive. And this is interesting, right? Arginine and lysine um, are asymmetric. Um, let's look at this in more detail. Um, Oded is probably going to look at the tyrosine and tryptophan. They don't make sense. But for the lack of time, I'll talk about this over lunch if, if you want. Um, but let's look at the positive inside rule for just a second. Uh, so these arginine, lysine, histidine, this is a spot just for comparison. Uh, you can see that they are truly uh, asymmetric. And they show us that the energy gap, this computed energy gap, again, not a totally kosher system, but tells us something about uh, there is there's about two kil kilocalories per mole for inserting an arginine uh, in the periplasmic relative to the cytoplasmic domain. Uh, this is true for arginine and lysine, but you can see that only arginine is actually stabilizing in the cytoplasmic uh, domain. Lysine is sort of near neutral. Uh, so it tells us something about not just the energy gap, this determines the orientation of the protein, but also, if you wanted to engineer a more stable protein, would you choose a lysine or an arginine uh, at the cytoplasmic domain? An arginine would be favored. Yes, please. How about in the mitochondria, we have two membranes, and uh, the genotype positive rule mm -hmm. might as well be uh, Outer membrane? No. There's no asymmetry uh, in the outer membrane. There are no negative charges uh, on the uh, lipids on the outer membrane. It's just for the 
plasma membrane, and also for the human plasma membrane. Um, Yes. But if you try to treat like different bacteria and then make sure that you get the same antigen, it could be, could be uh, environmental dependent. So, the bacteria so much. This, the, the clone, this is a, a little bit of experimental detail. Do I have a little bit more time? Uh, I, can, I can talk to you about this. This is very important, actually. The, wh what is the reference frame for making these calculations? I'll explain this. You have to. Um, rule out exactly the effects you, you mentioned. I'll, I'll explain how, how to do that. Um, so you can compare the values we get out of these uh, scales to other uh, scales. For instance, the White and Wimley uh, scale is here. Uh, our scale fits best to the Moon uh, scale. This is a, a, a scale by Karen Fleming, uh, where she uh, uh, mutated an outer member protein uh, and muted the core, uh, core positions on this uh, outer member protein, actually measured by biophysics, true biophysics of stability of this outer member protein relative to these uh, changes. And you can see that the correlation is not perfect, but it does make sense. If you focus on the aliphatic residues alone, what you see is that you get a perfect, uh, really near perfect correlation, uh, goes through the origin and the slope is one uh, for all the aliphatic uh, residues. So this suggests uh, that we do get the energetics correctly, even though the, the, the uh, the assays are so vastly different. She actually measures pure biophysically relevant energies, and we do this crazy viability and statistical analysis on, on the uh, protein. So you can now ask, can we quantitate the hydrophobicity uh, of the core of the membrane? Uh, and and we d when we talk about hydrophobicity, let's, let's think about what this means in, in terms of biophysics. Um, hydrophobicity actually relates to the properties of water. So if we look at water with no polar, no non-polar non uh, solute in it, water is free to rotate. We saw this in, in these beautiful simulations that Michael Levitt showed, where it's free to rotate between different conformations and form different hydrogen bonding patterns with other neighboring water molecules. If you have a, a non-polar solute, that disrupts this ability of the water uh, to rotate. Now there is an energy barrier for rotation of the water molecule, and this means that the entropy of the system has risen. If you take out the non-polar solute, into the protein core or into the membrane, you, you raise system en uh, entropy. This is the basis for the hydrophobic effect. So it's a surface area dependent term. The more surface area, the more the hydrophobic effect should be. So we could measure this for our data. So for every point mutation, where we introduce a, a substitution from uh, one aliphatic residue to another aliphatic residue, we measure the free energy change according to our uh, measurements relative to the change in uh, surface area. Uh, for a model helix that contains that mutation. And what you can see, I mean, it's, it's far from perfect, but uh, the, 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 the line going through this has a, a slope of 36 calories per mole per square angstrom, which is known as the atomic salvation parameter. For every square angstrom of nonpolar surface area, you would get 36 uh, calories per mole. Um, this is true also if you just compare the aliphatic residues themselves at the center of the membrane. Um, and this compares very favorably to analysis by uh, Charles de Lissy showing about 31 calories per mole per square angstrom for cores of membranes and for hydrocarbons. And it compares very unfavorably with von Heine's measurement of about 10 calories per mole. So it's about a three to four fold uh, difference. The, the, again, the potentials measured in, in the von Heine experiment are substantially more polar uh, than what we are measuring. Um, and just to end this, uh, we can use this in, in actually to now predict, we now have a scale for uh, insertion into the membrane, and we can use this in order to predict the locations of, me of s membrane uh, spanning segments, their orientations with respect to the membrane, and also the, the length uh, of the membrane span. This is something that's not been done before. Uh, and what you can see here is that, at least for some privileged cases, uh, we are getting the prediction uh, very, very uh, precise, uh, precisely. And, and we're now uh, preparing some work. And this also shows uh, that uh, the energetics we're measuring are sort of uh, consistent with uh, 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 membrane proteins in general. So just to summarize this part, um, the key point here is that if you are able to couple a, thermo um, a thermodynamic property, in this case the insertion of, of a segment into the membrane, with some viability screen, and it's reliable, it opens up a, a beautiful world, a beautiful opportunities for measuring uh, uh, thermodynamics by just counting 
uh, clones. And counting is easy. Um, so just count frequencies and infer from those uh, thermodynamic uh, values. Obviously, uh, we can use these now in order to improve our energy functions for modeling and design uh, in the membrane. This is very exciting for us. Uh, that's it. Good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we have uh, you have to ask him questions in person okay. because we're very late. <laughs> uh, lunch is in. Uh,